Hey, this is Karen Kingsbury, and welcome back to the show. Again, I am just blown away. Like, I can't believe we have been in the top 10 um, of podcasts. Like, what is going on? But you are faithful, and you keep coming back, and you keep listening, and today is going to be a special episode. Now, I may have told you before, but like when I write, it is such an emotional experience for me. I feel like I am just the first reader that God puts a story in my heart and it's like a movie in my heart and, and so no surprise that we have a movie coming out in just a week but um, he puts it like a movie and I see it and I feel it and so it's not unusual for my husband to walk by and see me crying at my laptop and when the kids were younger literally we would say mom is fine but she's just writing a chapter in her book so it's okay don't worry and I would literally be like sometimes sobbing like a character dies and I'm just I'm a mess and I'm crying and I put my laptop down and I have to grieve the loss of that character. And then my husband's always like, you know, you killed her. Like, can't you just bring her back? Like, she just doesn't quite get it. But I always tell him, you know, that the goal here is that if I can feel emotion and express emotion, then so will the readers. And that's a great release for them because it's sometimes hard to express your emotions. Um, Last week, we talked to Shalene Bryan and we were... Having We had almost an entire episode about laughter and how important it is to laugh that people can take this life a little too seriously sometimes and amidst the dishes and deadlines and decisions that we need to remember to laugh. Well, today on this very special episode, um, number 13, we are going to be talking about every other kind of emotion. And my special guest today is Tay Lautner. And so not to be confused with Taylor Lautner the actor who is Tay Lautner's husband. Um, Tay and Taylor uh, are friends of mine that I got to know through Shalene, and they also were two of the first people to ever watch our movie, that uh, my movie that's coming out called Someone Like You that opens in theaters everywhere on April 2nd. So it was super fun to have Tay and Taylor Lautner be able to, to watch it and tell me how much they loved it. So we kind of partnered up, and I said, you know, let me help support your gala. So they had a big gala for their uh, Lemons Foundation, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. And I got the privilege of being able to support that and uh, really lean into what this young couple is doing for the mental health um, kind of landscape in our nation. It's, it's tremendous, the impact that they are making. So it is my privilege today to welcome to the show an incredible young woman who is making a difference in our country, in our world, and I'm so proud to have her on the show, Tay Lautner. Aw, hey. that was so sweet. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, this is just so fun. I, um, Gosh, I didn't get to even be at the gala, which was like I was getting pictures from Shalene, but it was a huge success, right? Yeah, it was it, it was such a fun night. It was it was kind of like a whirlwind, and I feel like I blinked it, it was over, and woke up the next morning, and we were like, did that just happen? Uh, but yeah, it was our first one we've ever done, um, and it was just, it, w- it was more than I could have ever asked for. Yeah, kind of coincided with uh, with your anniversary, your wedding anniversary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I knew I wanted to do a gala, but I didn't really know like when or what. And then as the year started going by last year, um, my husband and I are like very sentimental and very like emotional people. And we were like, why don't we do our first gala on our first wedding anniversary? Uh, so we did it mm-hmm. the weekend of our wedding anniversary and it was it was so fun it was like the perfect way to spend it it's a beautiful morning. life can feel serene and then a single rock breaks the surface London. sending ripples through all of time it's been a hard year i'm so, so sorry <laughs> london was an in vitro baby the procedure gave us two embryos so in london might have a sibling hi can we talk? This is incredible. Are you in love with her? You can't bring her back. I could stay here forever. She's not ours. She's not in London. You are pushing me away. Every time that I'm with you, I was looking at London all over again. I can't change the past. She always wanted me to find someone like you. Thank God I do. That 
brings up probably my first and easiest question, which is I think everyone would love to hear about your love story. You're a very special person. And obviously your husband Taylor is a special one as well because he recognized that in you. And uh, he could see a one in a million, you know, diamond of a girl in your heart, how beautiful it is. And so can you just tell us, I'm sure you've told it before, but we would love to hear about your love story, how you met and how it became what it is. Yeah. Um, so we actually met through his sister. Uh, she, uh, ended up going to college with one of my like lifelong, like sister closest friends. And they became friends. I ended up becoming roommates, but I had gone to visit my friend. Uh, she went to Belmont. They both went to Belmont. I had gone out to Nashville to visit my friend for her birthday and met McKenna, Taylor's sister, uh, for the first time then. And then that was probably about August. And then fast forward to December, um, they had come home for Christmas break and my friend Alexa was like, let's do a girls night. And McKenna was there. And after that night, McKenna ended up calling Taylor and was like, you need to have a game night at your house. I met this girl. I want you to meet her. Uh, and then I had, I had no clue there was like a setup or anything going on. Cause I had only met my, that was my own second time meeting McKenna. Uh, so I get a text from her a couple days later, inviting Alexa and I over to this game night. And so we were like, wait, that sounds so fun. Let's go do it. And it took quite a few hangs to realize that Taylor was like pursuing me because I was just like not I, I did. I didn't think anything was going on. I wasn't like assuming anything. I was just there to play games and get the job done. Um, and I'd probably say maybe like two weeks went by of us all just hanging in a group um, and then. And this was yeah. in L.A. So was it during like school break? Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, they were home for Christmas break. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, and yeah, a couple of weeks later, um, he, I finally realized what what was going on, um, and then we dated for two weeks, and then he left to London to go film a show, and so our the first chunk of our relationship, the first like two and a half three months, was long distance, um, mm. and very long distance because of the time zone change from LA to London. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it it was like such a time that I cherished because by the time we came home, I felt like we had been together for so long because I knew so much about him because all we could do was talk and we got to like learn so many things about each other. Um, and that was six years ago, a little over six years ago. So we've been married mm -hmm. for a little over a year. We've been together for a little over six. But yeah, it's crazy how time flies. Well, I don't know that I realized that it had been so long. So... Um, because you, you, you both have very, there's some similarities to your story today, but at the time, uh, when you met and you had that beautiful chance to, you know, share emotion and communicate with each other, which is such a lost art anyway. And so you had that gift of distance in a way, um, mm -hmm. what were the commonalities then? You hadn't gone through the COVID situation, you know, so. Yeah, no, yeah, no, we, yeah, that was. I guess we started, we met in 2017, started dating in 2018. Um, I think, I think we're both, we both like the same things in the sense of we're both very chill people. We both like to be at home. We both like, we both like the same. We're the equal amount of like stay at home and adventurous, I feel like, mm -hmm. um, which is great <laughs> because I'm not super adventurous. So I'm happy that Taylor isn't you know, going, jumping out of planes and stuff. Cause I would just have a heart attack. Um, <laughs> but I think just us being able, like our communication was something that we learned, which also is kind of different, but we, we just learned to like talk through things. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that we both wanted, I think we both knew very early on that we wanted to be together. So it was a lot of communication pursuing that of, no, just learning deeper levels of each other, but also, you know, if there was conflict, talking through it the correct way um, and mm -hmm. learning how the other does. So, yeah. Yeah. So you then go back to school. And what year mm -hmm. were you then? That um, you I had just started, I had just started nursing school. Like you do okay. college for a little bit, you do your prereqs and then nursing school is two years. So I had just started that when he left too, which I feel like was a blessing because I had, had nothing to distract me. I ha just had to focus on school and he was gone. I couldn't go hang out with him. I couldn't do anything. I can only talk to him at like these specific periods of times. 
So yeah, I had just started school. I actually missed what you're like not allowed to miss school in nursing school, especially your first semester. And I had missed one day because I flew out. We had a four day weekend. I had flown out to London to go see him. And I had to miss because of my flight. I had to miss one of my classes. And I had gone up to my pharmacology teacher and I was like, I like I will I will take the test early. I will like do whatever I need to do. But I have a flight. And she was like, oh, my gosh, you need to go, 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 go. Like, don't worry about it. You can make it up later. I'll stay like after with you to teach you whatever. And I ended up bringing my book with me and like sent her a photo of me reading my book, like in the window of the London Hotel. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, That's I know. So, so, so I had just Wait, started school. Where were you at school then? Was that in L.A.? Yeah, 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 yeah. in L.A. Right. So it's an eight-hour difference to, to London. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's worth the difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 When, I was, when I was getting home from school, he was waking up to go into work, and then it just kind of would flip. So um, mm. it was it, the timing was fine, um, and it ended up working out with how our schedules lined up. But, yeah, yeah big time difference. Yeah. Okay, so you finished nursing school. Now what year is it? Now he's back in L.A. Yes, he's back in L.A. I finished nursing school in 2019, fall of 2019. Mm -hmm. And then I take my NCLEX, which is like the state license exam, in February of 2020. I have read some of your um, bits about being a nurse and about your heart for people. And I'm telling you, whoever your patients were, they were the most blessed, you know, Mm -hmm. and fortunate people because – you took on nursing like an angel takes on a project. Like you cared so much and care so much about people still, hence, you know, your foundation. But we'll talk more about that later. Um, it's literally the fall of 19. No one knows what's coming. The world is about to change. It changed for all of us. It changed at our home. It changed, you know, at the homes of everyone listening. But talk about that process then for you. Yeah. Uh, I guess... I had never, I had not had any intention of working in a hospital. I love OR. I love surgeries. I love all the guts and the gore. That's my favorite thing, Um, which is funny because (laughs) my husband can't even let me, like he he wouldn't even let me take his blood pressure when I was learning how to manually do it in school. (laughs) He's like, I'm going to pass out. You can't do that. I'm like, babe, it literally is just squeezing your arm. You're fine. Uh, (laughs) But anyways, Uh, that I had no intention of going into the hospital because I loved all this surgery and it gave me, you know, flexible schedule, holidays off, all the stuff that my parents were like, you need to do, like, don't go to the hospital, you need to do this. And I was like, okay. Um, But all surgeries, all elective surgeries ended up closing because of COVID. And so I wasn't able to, I just like started working in the OR and everything closed. I think I was working in like three different places And they all closed, everything closed. And I was like, I'm fresh out of school. I just learned all this stuff. I really like want to work and put my knowledge to use. Uh, I'm gonna apply to this one hospital that I loved during my clinicals. Cause the nice thing about going to school, like where I live is I got to try out all the hospitals during my clinical rotations. And I was like, I love this one Mm -hmm. hospital. Uh, I th- was like the best nursing there. I'm going to apply there. If I get into their new grad program, I'll work there. If not, then I'll just wait this thing out. Uh, I ended up getting the job, which I was kind of shocked <laughs> that I got um, just because it was not a likely thing um, for me to get because they only took a couple of people. And I was very excited um, about it. And my husband was not super excited. He was very excited for me, but he was not excited for me to be gone working 12 hours a day, but he was very, very supportive. But I ended up getting that job in, I think like August of 2020. So the initial COVID scare had kind of gone away. It was still, (laughs) it was still around, like obviously COVID was a thing still, but in the hospitals, it wasn't as intense. So when I started working, I was on a cardiac floor and everything was normal. They had, we had a floor that was COVID patients, but we didn't really have that many. So life was normal in the hospital for a couple months until like December when flu season kicked up and then that mm-hmm. went downhill from there. And it got kind of, I mean, really, really crazy for you. And it became a situation that in totally different ways, you know, you and your husband. And by then at this point, I'm guessing, were you engaged at this point? Or was it, you were just talking, you weren't, you were just, yes, seriously dating. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, and he was, yeah. Yeah. We didn't, yeah, get, okay. we didn't get engaged until what year? We didn't get engaged. We got engaged on 11, 11, 21 and then married on 11, 11, 22. Oh, and then the, yeah. the gala a year later. So that's so, yep. that's yep. so good. It's a good that's day. Wonderful. It's a good day. Yeah. You've made a good day out of that. Um, so you, things got, they got really crazy and your experience was really tough. And I think it's because you are a person who is very emotional and you express your emotions. You care deeply. I've noticed that a lot of nurses who kind of do this long-term tend to be more left brain. You know, they tend to be people who, you know, that not only can they say bring on the blood and guts, that's one thing, but they also can, they can compartmentalize a little bit, you know, their job versus like the actual human tragedy maybe playing out right in front of them. And I think that's maybe a little harder for you because you care so much, not that they don't care, but how did it, how did that end up going for you? And when it got worse that year? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think majority of my time working in the hospital, I was able to do that, but it's kind of like, I was running out of places to put things and then it just kind of overflowed Mm -hmm. is how I feel like my brain started working. But we are, my floor ended up switching to COVID and I had just, when, when I was training, I was on days and then you start as a new nurse on nights. So I had just gone to nights. It was my first night on my own was the night we switched to COVID and, um, we had upped our patient ratios. So normally safe patient nurse patient patient ratios is four to one on my floor. We had five patients and the acuity level of them was just higher than I had been taught or what we technically were allowed to have. Mm -hmm. We had patients that like had, um, we're not supposed to have any patients that are on any type of like breathing help, like, um, anything like that. And I wouldn't really have any intubated patients, but any patient that is like a high respiratory level, we're not supposed to have because we don't know how to work these machines or how to suction people. That's not like in our scope, but we had those. And a couple of my patients were those. And I was like, I don't even know how to like work these machines. And it was just a lot of running in and out of rooms of, you know, you have to put your gown on, your double mask on, your double gloves, your shield, you go in, you do your things, you leave, you take all of it off, you re-put it all on to go into the next room. And it was just night after night after night of doing that, mm-hmm. being short-staffed, having my manager call on my days off, being like, can you come in for a couple hours to take vitals? And of course I couldn't say no because I was like, I know what it's like to be short-staffed on the other side and I want to help. So I would literally go in from like 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. on my days off and go take vitals and help them where I could. So it was just a lot of months of that. And there would be times, I actually think the first night was the first night I actually like cried doing it just from being so overwhelmed and stimulated and scared and not being able to process what was going on. And, you know, these are people's lives and I haven't gone to the bathroom in nine hours or had a sip of water. Um, but there's like no, there's actually no time to, because these people like need you. Like it's not even, not even like charting or whatever the logistical of that aside. It was truly just, I had this many patients. They were all not doing well. They all needed these meds, all needed all of these things done. And there was one of me and I was like, I can't (laughs) do this. Mm -hmm. It was really hard. So it was a lot of months of that. And then it ended up dying down probably around like March, April of 21. And, um, and I was still, um, I was still working at the hospital, but I knew something was wrong, but I didn't really know what exactly. And my husband actually like had asked me like, Hey, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just tired. I just like worked the past couple of nights. And he was like, no, but actually like, are you okay? And we didn't really like talk anymore after that. Like it, the conversation just kind of ended because I didn't really know how to answer that. And I was like, how am I like feeling? I've never personally dealt with mental health struggles before. And I am one to push emotion down and also just like push through things and be like, I'm fine. I'll get over it. Um, So I kind of just pushed everything down and then I, I ended up getting COVID. I never got COVID while I was working, which is funny. I got it visiting my husband on set. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> and I was like, really? Like, what are the odds of this? But I ended up getting it really bad. Um, I was out of work for like almost two months because uh, I just was really sick. And that time was the first time I actually had like sat still for mm. the first time in like a year. And I was, I was like crying every day. I was so emotional. Just, I couldn't even do the laundry. Like that's how drained my body was. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, what the heck is going on right now? Like what, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? What it like, what is happening? And I truly feel like me getting sick was such a blessing because I never went back to the hospital after that. I told my manager, I was like, Hey, like, I don't think I can like come back in because of how sick I got if I get sick again. And I think that was God. God knew I couldn't do, I couldn't quit on my own. So he was like, you need to sit your butt down. Do you need to figure out what's going on in your head? And like, that gave me the quote unquote courage. I didn't have to tell her to her face. I was just like, I like physically can't come in anymore. Like I can't hmm. do this. And then that, that is what started my whole mental health journey process. Um, kind of, kind of everything, which is funny because you would think in that moment of the really hard time working through COVID that that would have been the hard part, but it actually wasn't until I removed myself from the situation that it just kind of all flooded. You brought up so many good points there and I just can't even imagine the number of people who will hear this and be helped by what you're saying because you're going to give people permission to be able to open up about what they're feeling and what they're going through and what they've stuffed into a closet. You said, and I, this is a great quote, you said, I ran out of spaces to put it. That is yeah. a beautiful line. And a lot of people will resonate with that, that you can only stuff things for so long. You were running on an autopilot sort of way where you were out of margin. There was nothing left. And then when, like you say, God gave you the ability to be home, to be able to process and to see where are all these tears coming from. It's a good, it's a good, um, surely a good sign for somebody who probably already does know about mental health struggles that the tears, the unexplained tears are a sign that there's something else going on and it's time to unpack it, open up those doors and those closets and get it out, you know? And so, um, so for you personally, when you realized that and you knew there was this struggle, there's a friend that's, you know, that is a part of your story who um, you lost. And was that before all of this or was it after? Was it like now you could relate to that person or how did that go? Yeah, that was actually um, I lost uh, my friend, Jared. He was like my best my best guy friend in high school. Uh, he was always just like person I could lean on. He would always tell me like I looked pretty when I was having a bad day or I'm going through a breakup. He was just like the best friend, but he ended up uh really severely struggling with bipolar and took his life during a manic episode. Mm. That would have been that was the I think the year before I met Taylor. Yeah, 20 2016 or mm. 6 years. It was 6 years ago. Well, now almost yeah. seven, but, um, yeah, it was before I met Taylor. So, um, that was also something that kind of opened my eyes to mental health or what kind of got me passionate about it because I had no clue that my friend was struggling with this. Um, and do you remember where you were? Like when you got that call, do you remember where you were oh, or what? Li like yesterday it very distinctly, I was in, um, I was at a kitchen table and I was making flashcards for my anatomy and physiology class. And, um, my friend had called me and she was like, Jared's gone. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she was mm -hmm. like, he took his life and proceeded to tell me what happened because someone had called her and told her, um, mm -hmm. I just remember, I, I didn't even cry. I think for the first like hour, I was like, just in shock of just like, what it what? Like what? You're telling me like my best friend isn't here anymore? Like what are you saying? Um, so mm -hmm. his his journey really um, opened my eyes to mental health and just wanting to help people, you know, that struggle because I personally had never struggled with it. But here is like my friend who, you know, is no longer here because of his mental health struggles. Um, 
that and is you have what that question. I'm, you know, and I'm sure at that point you had the question that anyone would have in your spot with a best friend, a close somebody so close that takes their life, and that is why. You know, why didn't you talk to me? Why didn't you come to me? Um, how have you dealt with that? Even just before you even got to this place personally yourself and, and thought about the foundation, as a young person, you know, with just no real capacity to be able to handle something like that. I mean, it's just so much. Um, how did you process that? I think by learning about mental health, I think the biggest thing I've learned over the years is um, we're so quick to ask those questions. Like, why didn't they ask for help? Like, what mm -hmm. could I have done? Or why didn't they say this? Or why that? The, the complexity of mental health is something we've only barely, like, scratched the surface of. Mm -hmm. And he, in, in his manic episodes, is a completely different human then he is, you know, when he is not, when, mm -hmm. you know, he's on the correct meds. Um, so it was just a lot of, and still is, a lot of learning the complexities of mental health when people are like, why didn't they, like, say, why didn't they ask for help? Like, that's selfish of them to take their life. It's actually, mm -hmm. a lot of people, when they do take their life, it, in their mind, it's a selfless act. They think they are burdening people. Like, I mean, there's so many different reasons why someone would want to do that, but it's just so not what it seems. Um, so that's been really cool to learn, you know, over these past six years is just the, the complexity of, you know, how someone's brain who doesn't have a mental illness would think of it versus someone who has a mental illness, how they view and perceive the world, their life, everything. Yeah. That's a great um, tool that you just gave for people that if you're listening to this and you're thinking, what did I do wrong? How come I wasn't enough? How come they didn't reach out to me? That they could, they, you can lean into learning more. You can lean into more research to understand the situation better so that you don't process it from a healthy brain what somebody with an illness was going through. I think you're so right. I think that's such a freedom to be able to, you know, there's, two, there's many aspects. I mean, there's the loss, obviously, but then there's the understanding that it wasn't obviously not your fault and it wasn't their fault, but that it was something that was happening. And how now the next step is how do we help those kinds of people who are, who are walking through that today? And so there you were after, after the nursing, um, you know, a year in the hospital and having the illness and realizing what is all this emotion and realizing that no one is, you know, kind of immune to the possibility of going through a mental health a crisis in their own life. Yeah. Yeah, it and for my friend, he his bipolar was brought on from experiencing a traumatic incident. Um mm. and which I didn't know about the incident. I actually just we just had his mom and sister, I'm so super close with his family. We had them on our podcast and they ended up just kind of telling me all of the details of, you know, his life and all these things. Cause I'd never wanted to ask like, you know, what, what were the details of like your son's death? Like, I just did not want to ask that, but they, they came on and they, it was, it was such a healing episode to like hear and learn more about him and, you know, how his life played out. But he, I would say he struggled with his mental health, uh, just because of his upbringing. Um, his mom isn't his actual mom. Um, and a lot of other details, but from, um, witnessing a traumatic incident was what sparked his bipolar. So it truly can happen to anyone. And that is why my husband and I stress therapy so much because you have to have, like, if let's say you like, we always say you got to have your toolbox handy and the toolbox needs to be filled with all the tools you need for when something breaks so, you know, you're like, oh, I need a screwdriver today. You got it in that toolkit. And that is why, like, I didn't have a toolkit when I was struggling with my mental health. And it took me a long time to figure it out. And now having gone through it, I'm like, this would have been so much better if, you know, I went to therapy or had some form of coping or, you know, knew how to handle all of this. And people always think, like, therapy is for when 
you know, it hits the fan and it's it's going down the drain and everything's bad. And yes, it is for that time, but it's also to act just to learn like how you th- how your thoughts are, how you deal with things. It's to have that toolkit ready for when you go through something traumatic. You're like, okay, right. I know what to do here. Right. It's just so true. We need people, you know, we need some, I mean, if there's, you know, there's many wonderful counselors out there and I know at your, um, it's lemons by Tay, right? Is that, that's a website. So lemons yeah, by yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Their website and her, uh, Instagram. Yes. And Instagram. Yeah. And there's resources there. You know, we have everything from the living word of God for people who are believers to, you know, Christian counselors to secular counselors to, you know, that good friend. And, and the, the key here is to express it. You know, your husband was saying to you, are you okay? Like, what is wrong? So, you know, for kindness looks a lot of different ways. And I think for the healthier person, it might look like listening. You know, it might look like um, the compassion to just lean in and listen and to be paying attention. Not that we have complete control, because a lot of times the signs aren't just hidden because it is, it's pushed into one of those closets in our minds. But then for the person who's struggling and feeling like, why am I, I can't process, like my brain doesn't feel like it's working right. Or even like you said, just to learn about behaviors, like, you know, why do I do this thing I don't want to do? Why do I get angry at that? Or how come I, you know, don't stop eating that or whatever, whatever the thing is, like there's behavioral patterns that we get into that a counselor is just like a professional listener and they will help you to hear that. I went to a counselor when I was, um, it's part of my story, I always say I've told a thousand stories, but I've never told mine. But before I was a, a Christian, I was dating a guy and it really, I can't blame him. I mean, he was a, he was a guy who was, he wasn't faithful. Um, he'd been like a best friend. We dated for six years and we were in a, in this relationship that was like a mini marriage, but it wasn't, we weren't living together, but we were just way too close for as young as we were. And, um, and he was, he drank and he drank a lot and he would sometimes drink a six pack before we would even get in the car. And I'd be terrified that we're going to have a drunk driving accident. And it was giving me panic attacks. I started having panic attacks over all of this. And I went to a counselor, my mom, dad connected me to a counselor, which I was so thankful for. And she didn't, it was, she didn't have, she didn't even like say that much. It was amazing. She listened and she let me tell her what I was going through. And then she said, you know, she would give a pause and she would say, well, why do you stay? You know, why are you, why are you, you're, you know, you go to his house and his, he lived with his parents. You know, we were, you know, this was between the ages of like 17 and 23. And um, he would, you know, get drink his six pack. And then I, why would I like, go home? Like, just say, you know, I think I'm going to go home. And like, well, I would say, well, I'm worried he's going to get mad at me. And what if he gets mad at you? Like just processing it, playing it out. And all of a sudden, like logic found its way, like true north of logic of right decisions found their way. And I was able to leave him. And it was the right decision to make, but I couldn't make it. I was just really paralyzed emotionally. Um, And that counseling time, which was maybe only for a couple of months, but it it was a life changer for me to be able to finally stop repeating the bad behavior of staying with someone who wasn't the right person. Uh, And that's something I think a lot of people can relate to, you know being stuck in a relationship that, you know, with someone who's hurting you in some way, um, it's just one aspect, obviously, of mental health. But, you know, a counselor can help. It's an objective person who's trained to ask the right questions and listen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it really makes a difference. So you, you're, you know, obviously now you're, you and Taylor are, you know, obviously more serious and you're getting ready to be engaged. But you, I, at which point did you start the Lemons Foundation? I started it, let's see, I started it in, in 2021. Okay. Um, I, or actually, I'm getting so confused because we're in the new year. It was 20, let's see. 22. Well, you got married in 20, okay, yeah, because you got married in 22. Right? Mm-hmm. I think I started mm-hmm. it in 22. <laughs> All these years <laughs> blend together, I swear. I feel like this, I feel like 2024 is going to be the first year where it doesn't blend. I feel like the past, like, 20 20- 20 to 23 has just become mush in my brain. Yeah. And this, I feel like this is the first year. I mean, we also decided to move and get married in the same year. Mm-hmm. And 
that was a lot. And then we moved again. So I, I'm like, there's no more moving. I'm not getting married again. So hopefully it doesn't feel like mush. You don't want uh, more closets full. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I do not want to um, have to back and move again. But but yeah, I had started it. The It's kind of funny because the whole the whole reason or the whole reason why I started it um, before the, there was the foundation, I had started Lemons by Tape, which was just like a blog at the time. I knew so many people were struggling. I mean, obviously people in the nursing community, but everyone was struggling during COVID. So I had started that in 2021 Mm -hmm. and I was just using it to come out with, you know, blogs. I shared my story. I shared, you know, things that were helping me self care ideas. Like, you know, I love taking a bath. I love going out, like just, just easy things for people to implement into their lives that Mm -hmm. were helping me. And then I, I swear Taylor and I, I mean, it's not a joke. It actually is real, but I, God talks to me in my sleep and I come up with all of these things in my sleep and I wake up and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to do this. It keeps happening. So it's proven true. But I woke up one morning and I was like, "Hun, I think I have to start a nonprofit. And he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I don't really know how to do that, what to do. Um, but I think I'm going to do it. And he was like, okay. Uh, so I ended up meeting with Shalene. I called her because she is family friends with my husband's family. And I was like, hey, like, can we go to lunch? I like have some questions to ask you because she has skipped one. So obviously she's the queen of nonprofits. Um, and I just sat down with her at lunch and was like, this is what I want to do. I told her my story and she was like, oh my gosh, yeah, let me help you. And I ended up getting our EIN number within a month. And I called her and I was like, hey, like we're officially like unofficially official because it takes some time it takes like over yeah. a year to get everything set up but she was like what are you talking about and I was like yeah I got I got our number she was like you got your number and I was like yeah and I'm like confused <laughs> why she's so confused and she was like that took me eight months to get like how did you make that happen so fast and I was like I, I, I didn't do anything. I don't know. Um, God, spoke to so, you. God told yeah, you to yeah. do it. <laughs> so it really just like kind of, it kind of just happened. Um, but it's mental health based, obviously. And I, I want it to, the reason why I started it is I want to be able to help people, give people resources, the education, and just like the community to, you know, be able to come together. Our social media is like our biggest page. Um, it's Lemons by Tay. And we share so many types of resources from everything from postpartum, anxiety, um, substance abuse, uh, at, at literally everything you can think of in that category. We you know talk about, share resources, tips, ideas. Um, mm-hmm. So that was kind of where it came from was I'm, I've learned over these past few years how important community is whether that is in person or now online too, having a safe space to Mm. take in good content because that is where like my generation, this next generation is, is all online. And I was like, I need to put something out there that looks aesthetically pleasing that people are going to want to look at and follow, but it's good information that they're taking and it's going to be helpful to them. So that was, that was kind of what it, why I started it and what it's been doing. I'm kind of excited for that time in heaven when there's this line of people that are wanting to talk to you and thank you for putting out this material that changed their life and saved their life. Like it's such a big deal, Tay. It is. And I'm, I'm just so thankful to get to hear your story. And I know, I know for me and my husband, when we do something like making this movie that we made, um, you know, someone like you, which comes out on April 2nd, just a few days. But when we did that, we had to come together for it. And I know that it was important for you and Taylor to be, for him to believe in this and be a part of it. And he believed in it for a very personal reason. I don't know if you're able to share that, but I would love to hear you know, how that conversation went when you realized some of the stuff he went through because of his visibility. Yeah. I mean, obviously he essentially grew up in the spotlight. He did his first movie, I think when he was 12. So, and went into the industry at eight. So he was very privy to the world of that at a very young age. Twilight ended up coming out. I think he booked it when he was 16. Uh, so he was very young. A lot, a lot of people don't know that he was so young. 
I mean, I didn't know that until yeah, I really didn't. I, know. I think I thought he was like 19 or something. Yeah. Mm-mm. No, wow. he filmed it from. He filmed it from 16 to 20, I think. Wow. Years old. Yeah. So he was. I mean, he was young. He's probably 17, 18 when the first, second, third movies came out, and the amount of just the amount of exposure, the amount of criticism, the amount of, I mean, literally everything you can think of. Thank God social media wasn't, he always says like social media wasn't really a thing then at, like it mm-hmm. is now. And he's like, I can't imagine what that would have been like, you know, then. Um, but he just went through years of that. and was just always, just always in the spotlight and being criticized and, you know, wanting to do the right thing. Scaredy was going to, you know, say the wrong thing. It almost like came robotic, like in the way he would answer questions on a carpet or whatever. He was like, how is this going to sound? Like, like media trained robot, like to a T. Mm. Um, but then on top of that, like he, he would never like want to leave his house. I think uh, when we first started dating was kind of the first time he'd ever really gone to the grocery store or like gone to a movie theater. Cause he never was like able to experience that. Um, it would be that so, kind of reaction. Cause he would be so visible. Yeah. Yeah. He would leave his house and there would be like 10 paparazzi cars following him in and out. And, just no privacy, just not normal, not an ounce of normalcy in his life. And after he had filmed um, the one TV show that he went away to film when we had first started dating, he came home and I think kind of took like a subconscious break from Mm. the industry. I think he knew, I think something in him knew he needed a break, but he didn't he never came out and said, I need a break from this. He just kind of like stopped doing things. Mm-hmm. Um, and then COVID happened and then that was more so of a like a chill time for him. He did like one movie, but it was an Adam Sandler production movie. So it was like fun with a bunch of his friends. So mm-hmm. he doesn't really count that as work. But um, he really just took some time to kind of process. He never processed like what he had gone through or, you know, um, dealing with body image stuff and just all of these things that have come with fame over, you know, the span of his lifetime. He never kind of took a step back and thought about it um, or even just experienced normalcy. Uh, I think I think us being together is really cool because I don't come from any of that. And so we'll literally like do even even still today, we'll like bring up stuff, you know, things I experienced in high school or things I did in high school that he never did. And he's like, that's weird. I would never let like our kids do that. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's so normal. That's what you do. And like just <laughs> things like that, because our upbringings in a sense were so different. But I'm so thankful because he is like I always say he's the worst famous person because he's so normal. Like if you didn't know who he was, you would have no clue. Uh, and I'm very thankful for, you know, his parents for raising him like that. But also he's just he's just got such a good head on his shoulders. And I'm it's been really cool to watch him over these six years of us being together. I feel like each year I've said, like, he can't get any better. Like he the word that I describe him as when we first started dating is respectful. Like I had never had someone respect me like he did and just like honor me in a way that like even when we had first started dating he was just so kind and like really cared about what I thought what I felt and respected it and uh, I had never had that before and each year I say like I don't think he can get better and every year he's proven me wrong just the, the growth that I've seen in him of you know the man that he is today like mentally just like healthy he's put in the work he's really just the confidence in himself I've seen like a huge growth it's just it's been really cool to watch him kind of go from like not even knowing he needed to leave the industry to now he's like okay I'm, I like I'm actually really healthy and I miss this work and I'm excited to get back into this yeah it's so beautiful and you share a faith you know in God and um that's a beautiful thing that you have and that's made you I think both stronger and you know, the picture of marriage, be the two shall be one. And here you both, like God brought you together because you both had these 
experiences that you needed to unpack. It's such a good way to say it because you stuff until you can't stuff anymore and you have to reach a point of unpacking and you got to do that together, which I think is beautiful. And for the people married who are listening, you know, lean into that spouse. And maybe if you don't have that sense of communication now, maybe try to find it, make more room for it, make the space for it. Like you said, that's part of self-care is, you know, I feel like self-care is, is very much a biblical thing in the sense of leaning into what God has right in front of you. But if you don't stop to look at the mountains and the hills where your help comes from or to breathe and feel the breeze in your hair or even just to look at your spouse, you know, you, you look at each other during your vows and then as soon as the vows are over, you turn and face the world, you know, the, the, the people there for your wedding. And it's sometimes like we forget to turn back and look at each other. And you have done that. You too have done that. And the first, the most, one of the most beautiful things to come of that is the Lemons Foundation. Um, so, okay, just like we're winding up. So what, what would you, what advice do you want to give to somebody who's concerned for someone right now? I think the advice I would give is don't be afraid to ask them if they are struggling. Uh, something I have learned is the biggest thing about, you know, someone who may be suicidal or even if they're not to that extent, but someone that may be, we, it's become this thing that, um, a myth that if you ask someone if they're suicidal, it will implant the idea of that into their mind. That is absolutely false. Um, very scientifically proven. It actually does the opposite. And if someone is struggling and you confront them and say, hey, I'm worried about you. Are you like, are you thinking about taking your life? Are you struggling with this? Whatever it may be, it doesn't need to be that extent. The person hearing it will either be like at this point where they have nothing left to do, but be like, yes, I am. Or they're going to hear you say that and be like, maybe they're not ready to talk about it yet. Or maybe that's what you say. Maybe it's, hey, we don't need to talk about this yet if you're not ready, but like I'm here if you're struggling and you need someone to talk to. Just like giving someone, having having someone someone know that they have someone to talk to is huge. And it can definitely be terrifying. I remember when, when I was working in the hospital, when we would have patients that were, um, you know, may have been suicidal or whatever, we would have to ask them, like, do you have a plan to take your life? And I remember being like, this is so weird asking this question. Um, but it actually is such a loving question, even though the person asking it, it's more scary for the person asking it than it is the person receiving it. So I think yeah. that would be my advice is it is less scary to who you are talking to than yourself. Yeah, it puts a bridge there. You know, if, without, I mean, there's this chasm. If they're living in this imaginary place where no one knows what they're going through, no one knows that they're considering something that drastic and, and tragic, then by asking, you literally throw out a rope bridge across the chasm and you yeah. allow them the opportunity to walk across it when they're ready. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So and what about for the person struggling? Ooh, the person struggling is, it's so, it's so cliche, but truly you are not alone. Like that is the biggest thing I have learned and I have heard. That is like the number one thing, you know, when people write to us, if we run into people in public, they're like, oh my gosh, like I listen to your podcast and I feel not alone. And I've, I've been doing this for so long. I'm like, yeah, obviously like we all, there's everyone has something no matter what they may portray on social media and their life, whatever it is, we truly like are not alone. And it sounds so silly, but we are all struggling with it and um, not to minimize it, but everyone has something. So that shouldn't deter you to think something's wrong with me. It's mm -hmm. more so just, hey, there's other people struggling. I've got something going on and just encourage I mean, I would encourage whoever is listening to take that next step and help, whether it's talking to a friend, a therapist, whether it's reading a book, reading a blog, go listen, listening to a mental health podcast, listening to an audio book, whatever it is to make you kind of feel more comfortable about the idea. Um, I love, um, I've talked about this before, but I love, I love this idea of, um, obviously prayer is like the biggest thing and you know, God can do miracles, 
But this analogy of, you know, let's say I fall down and my arm is broken and I'm hanging and my arm is just hanging half broken, trying to give you the visual if you're listening. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to be like, God, here you go. Fix it. Like, please, like, amen. No, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to hospital. I'm going to go get surgery done. I'm going to get the nuts and bolts put in, put, get the cast on. But okay. throughout that entire time, I'm praying. I'm still having that in my life. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused that they're like, I'm praying and nothing's changing. I'm like, yeah, well, that's because you got to do the work. God gave you the ability to do the work. You can't just be like, here you go, fix it. Obviously, mm. you know, he's going to be a part of your life to, you know, support you in whatever way that is, you know, prayer, talking to her, worship, however you incorporate that into your life. But you got two legs. We, we got to do the work and it's scary. But I think hearing that analogy, I heard that from someone and I was like, that's so like, that's so real. And it's Perfect. so true. And like, God gave us this ability to, you know, have communication with people, be able to do things for our own, lift weights, like go out on a run. Like we have these bodies that can do all of these things. And that's just something that he's going to support us along the way doing. That's beautiful. I had chills when you were saying that. Just um, we have to do the work. There's no question. In um, Real quick, just, you know, as a segue to there's a lot of emotion in uh, my movie coming out next week. Someone like you. What did you and Taylor think when you watched it? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm actually really excited to watch it again because we haven't seen it since you sent it to us a while ago. Now it's um, really good. We have a score now. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. Did you hear it with the actual audio? No, just kidding. Um, no, I I mean, it's it's such a it's such a heartwarming story. And it's so it's really cool that it brings in like actual real life scenarios of struggling. And I mean, I almost said some things I don't want to give it away, but it brings in true mental health struggles and situations that people on the daily deal with. And, you know, watching these characters develop through that, I think is really cool what you've done in your book. And it's really cool to watch it come to life. Well, thank you so much. You know, I want to, people to be able to find you. I want them to find your podcast. So uh, tell us where we can find that. I'm going to link it in the show notes. I also want, I want to make sure that everyone knows that the suicide hotline number will be in the show notes as well as um, some other counseling links. So we're going to provide that. But how can they reach you? That's awesome. Um, I am on Instagram at Tate Lautner. Um, there's also the Squeeze Podcast or the Squeeze Podcast, wherever you listen to it. Apple, Spotify, YouTube. Uh, we're also on Instagram out there. Lemons by Tay is our mental health page. Also lemonsbytay.com. We have all of our resources there as well. Uh, I got like a link in my bio to shortcut all of that. If you, if you need it, there's a lot of different places to click. Um, but, but yeah, that's it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And I do. I picture that moment in heaven with people just like lined up and it's not about fame or, you know, movies or any, you know, even, you know, a nursing hero like you are, but it's literally you were the bridge. You caused God allowed you to make a bridge for people to not just sit in a place that they don't know any way out, but to find a way out and to find a way to get help, to find a way to take the lemons and to make lemonade, like you say. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for sharing your heart today. It has uh, meant so much. Um, I'm going to close. I'm going to close this real quick <clears throat> in prayer, just to pray for the people listening who might be afraid to take that step. And uh, but thank you so much, Tay. It's been been really thank special. You. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for um, for for making us and creating our minds in such complex ways. But thank you that you've also made us to need people. I pray for those listening that if they're going through something very hard and if no one knows that they would reach out to someone in their in their life, maybe it's someone at their church, a family member, or a counselor, Lord, let them reach out. It's not like they're the only one. This is a lot of people who are going through mental health struggles right now after COVID and what's been going on in our nation. There's a lot of division uh, and a lot of hurting. And I just pray, Father, that uh, you will move the hearts of those listening that if they need help to get it today, and I thank you so much for Tay and for Taylor and for their ministry and, and love for people and for the way they're helping people with the Squeeze podcast and with the uh, Lemons Foundation. We just thank you for their hearts, young people who are making an impact in this world and being such a bright light, Lord. May you be glorified in that. And we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Ah, well, next week, I am so excited to have my husband, Donald, back on the show. It's been several weeks, and we will talk specifically about how he put his hands on my shoulders and said, we have to make this movie, someone like you. We have to do it, even if we have to sell everything. So to have a, a husband who believes in me like that, it was almost like in that moment, I knew there was nothing I couldn't do. And we'll talk about that next week. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Karen Kingsbury Show. Um, please share this, like it, follow it, subscribe, and we'll see you next week.